If you'd like to follow along in the reading of the Word of God this morning, if you would turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. And our ver- the, the text is really in verses 14 through 18. I thought I would just go ahead and read the, uh, the whole chapter in context since he's really making what, what we're looking at this morning an application of what he's just said. And it really has to do with uh, the end of the world, interestingly enough, uh, how it's going to end, although it doesn't tell us uh, when. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. This is what the Lord tells us in his word. He says, this is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the word spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. And the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth by his word are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distorts, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, as you know from this series, we've been looking at the fact that there are many reasons why people will not accept what the Bible says. Why they will not receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior we might say there are just about as many excuses as there are people. But let's not forget where the the real problem lies, and we know that it doesn't lie with the evidence. So many people think that scientists have proven the theory of evolution, and because they think that scientists have proven it, they really don't think they need God to explain anything. They don't think they need anything really further to explain the design, uh, the beauty, and all of the evidence that God gives to us, not only on a microscopic scale within the creation, but also on a macroscopic scale in the universe. Now, you might be surprised to discover, and maybe 
this might shock you, but as, as I was, well, I went to a college where um, actually we did a good deal, spent a good deal of time examining the evidence. There isn't a shred of evidence for evolution at all. The evidence for creation, on the other hand, though, is overwhelming. There isn't a problem with the evidence. Now, others think that there's a problem with the Bible, that the Bible is just one among many religious books, and it's really no different than the rest. Why do you think this one's so special? It's full of contradictions, hard to understand. Actually, the Bible is quite a bit different than other religious books. For one thing, it doesn't contain any contradictions. They can all be resolved quite logically and reasonably, at least the ones that are the so-called apparent contradictions. And if we had time, we would look at many other ways in which the Word of God shows itself to be the Word of God and not, again, just any other religious book. But we're also going to see this morning that it isn't at all hard to understand. It's quite clear, especially in that most important area of salvation. So where does the real problem lie if it isn't with the evidence and it isn't with what the Bible says? I already told you in our introduction to this um, in the worship service, the problem lies with the heart. The Bible tells us the heart is deceitful above all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jesus himself, when he comes into the world, says this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. The problem is with the heart. The heart is evil. It is as a result of the fall as we're going to see. It doesn't really matter then what anyone says or how convincing an argument they may give, how much evidence there is in nature or in the Word of God itself. You will only accept what you want to accept. If you don't want to do it, you won't. Your heart is the reason why so many questions are raised regarding the truth of Scripture. What you're really looking for is the same thing the Sadducees were looking for, and the Pharisees, when they confronted Jesus, you're looking for a reason not to believe rather than for a reason to believe. Now, if you understand that going into our subject, I think you're going to be more open, perhaps, to the truth. This morning, let's consider one of the questions that you've probably raised at one time or another as to why you don't believe the Bible. And that is basically, there are so many opinions of what the Bible means, can you really understand it? Can you really know it? Or is it just a matter of each person's interpretation? That's your interpretation. Nobody really knows what the Bible says. Well, you need to understand that the Bible, and especially in what it says about how you can be saved, what God has done to save man, is clear. You can understand it. Now, I hope you realize from the passages of Scripture that we've already looked at that you're not the first person ever to raise that objection. The excuse has been around as long as the Bible has been around. We just read in Peter that um, there were people in his day who were reading Paul's writings, and they didn't quite understand it. He says there were certain things in what Paul wrote that were hard to understand. Some were twisting what he had to say. Others were uh, perhaps missing the message but they did not trust what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, Peter says they were, well, twisting the scriptures to their own destruction, and that was something they needed to be on the lookout against. But the fact is, the same thing is happening today. And the people who are telling you that the Bible cannot be understood are doing exactly what those people were doing in Peter's day. They're trying to twist the meaning of the scripture so that you will not see it. Again, because of their hearts. They may not realize they're doing this, but they are in fact. So let's look at two things this morning. Let's look, first of all, at the fact that, yes, there are some things in the Bible that are hard to understand. But secondly, let's look at the fact that we should be thankful that the things that we do need to know for our salvation, the Lord has made so clear 
that anyone can understand them. So first of all, let's consider that there are some things in the Bible that are, in fact, hard to understand. And that is one of the reasons why we have so many Christian denominations in the world. Now, I should say at the outset that there aren't all these different churches simply because there are disagreements on what the Word of God says. Many of the churches that we see today actually grew out of uh, various movements that took place in different nations in the world. They came out as a, uh, as a byproduct of revival. At one time, there was a monolithic church. There was only one church in the world. That church um, doesn't exist anymore, actually, which is interesting, although uh, some would say it continues in the Roman church, what we call Roman Catholicism, and perhaps Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, before that actually took place, everybody was together in one big denomination. And then at a certain time in history, I think it was 1054, the East split from the West. And then during the time of the Reformation, various churches split off as the Lord brought about revival and as he brought about conviction over what the Bible teaches regarding the gospel, certain denominations were formed. The Lutheran church formed in Germany. The Dutch Reformed church formed in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands. The Presbyterian Church in Scotland, the Anglican Church in England, and even within these various churches, there were also subsequent movements that caused other churches, such as the Methodist Church from revival in England. Now, let me just mention, those churches exist because of different movements of the Spirit of God in history in different nations. And by the way, uh, even within, let's say, this denomination, uh, if, if they do a church plant in another country, they won't just you know, plant this church in another country. What they'll do is they'll plant a church for that country, and so it'll actually produce a new denomination. Even though there are many denominations, it doesn't mean, even with ones that I've just mentioned, that there are really that many differences between them. They agree on a large number of things, but again, they exist because of these different movements of the Spirit of God in history. But we do also need to admit that some of these churches do exist because they actually disagree on what the Bible says. There are large areas of disagreement. Just to give you a few examples, some disagree on who it is ultimately that uh, chooses who's going to be saved. Is it man choosing God or is it God choosing man? There are churches that disagree on what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns to this world, which we all agree is going to return. That's one thing we're going to look at. But what's going to happen when he comes back? Is he going to set up a kingdom on earth that's going to last for a thousand years? Or is he going to raise the dead, bring them all to final judgment, make the final separation, and bring in the new heavens and the new earth? There are churches that believe that the gifts that God gave to establish his church during the New Testament time, what we call the, the charismatic gifts, that those gifts are still in continuance today. And there are others who believe that those gifts have served their purpose and the Lord has done away with them. There are many areas where Christians disagree. And sometimes the disagreements are so strong and perhaps make such a difference in what the churches feel like they need to be doing for God that they can't work together. There's one uh, great illustration of this in, in church history during the time of the Reformation. You know, the Reformation actually broke out in, in different parts of Europe, and each place it did, there were these leaders, you know, that were leading it, and during that time, they tried to bring some of these leaders together, see if they could uh, work through their differences and work together. And Martin Luther, as you recall, met with Ulrich Zwingli at this colloquy that met at Marburg. And Luther did not want to work with Zwingli because he did not believe that Zwingli was even a Christian. And the reason was simply that he disagreed with him on the subject of the Lord's Supper. Now, again, sometimes disagreements can be very strong. But I hope you agree with me that if we disagree on a point that doesn't have to do with the gospel that we shouldn't say, well, that person is not a Christian. I'm not going to work with them. No, we should embrace one another, especially those, of course, who believe what we believe regarding the gospel because that means that they are brethren. So again, this is simply to say that Christians do disagree on some things because some things may be difficult to understand. 
as Peter wrote regarding Paul's writings. But now here's the main point. Just because that is true of some things does not mean that it's true of everything. There is one thing that all these churches actually do agree on, what we might call the fundamentals of the gospel, those things that have to be believed if a person is actually going to be saved. The Lord has made these things so clear that they really cannot be mistaken. Now, let me go ahead and, and tell you what those things are because those are the things you need to believe in order to be saved. And let me show you these things from the Word of God so that you can judge for yourselves whether or not the Bible actually says what all these churches believe, including ourselves. Now, the first thing I've already told you is the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. All churches, all Christian churches believe that that is true. They believe that what Paul wrote, again, this was not one of the more difficult things that he wrote that Peter's referring to, but what he wrote to Timothy is absolutely true in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which I believe is your, the uh, memory verse. All Scripture is inspired by God. And let me just say here that what the word means is breathed out. The Scriptures, what were written in the Word of God, this is, so, um, well, this, this is just as if God spoke it. That is how closely related it is to God. It is His Word. It is not the men who were inspired. It's not that God put His ideas into their minds and then they wrote them down but that God so oversaw what they were writing and the circumstances in which they wrote, the problems they addressed and so forth, that what they wrote was exactly what he wanted written down. The Bible is his word. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Every Christian church believes it is absolutely true in everything that it says, and it is the absolute authority for everything that we believe as Christians. We may not agree on everything that the Bible says, what exactly it means, but we do agree that it is His Word. This has the final say on what it is we are to believe and what it is we are to do. The second thing that we all agree on is the fact that there is only one God and that that one God is not simply a glorified man. It's not somebody we created in our image, but this God is infinite. This God is eternal. This God is unchangeable. As we've been looking at in the evening services, he has unlimited knowledge. He has infinite love and he is especially an infinitely holy God who loves what is good and what is right. And what distinguishes the true God from any false gods besides the things I've already mentioned is the fact that this God has three persons within him. He is not just one God, one infinite, eternal, unchangeable being with one center of personality, as Jehovah's Witnesses may believe or others, but he actually is three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Father is God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, for, uh, for us there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist for Him. The Bible says that the Son is God, the author to the Hebrews, representing the Father speaking to His Son in eternity before He comes into the world, He says, but of the Son, He says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. The Father calls the Son God. And the Bible says the Spirit is also God. When Peter was speaking to Ananias with regard to the lie that he committed, he said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit they are three persons, but there is one God. And if you do not believe that, you believe in a false God. You do not believe in the true God. And the false God that you believe in can't save you. Only the true God can. Every Christian church agrees with this point. God is three persons. 
Now, the third thing that all Christian churches agree on is that Jesus is the Son of God in human flesh. That the Son of God became a man in order to save men. That he came into the world in a very special way, you know, in, in a way kind of like we did, but different. In that he was conceived and born of a girl who had never had relations with a man. And we know there was a reason why that is the case. It's because so, so that he wouldn't be uh, tainted with the sin that we come into the world with because our forefather who represented us in a covenant that God made with him in the Garden of Eden, sinned against God and made all of us guilty, made all of us sinners. That is circumvented in the case of Jesus Christ. Now, that was a very unusual thing. That something like that should happen. And Mary at the time was not married, but she was engaged. And as you might imagine, her husband-to-be was a bit concerned that she was expecting this child, and they had not yet come together. They had not yet been married. They were only engaged. And so in order to... Uh, comfort him and to assure him that Mary had been faithful, who was, of course, the name of the young girl, an angel came to Joseph to tell her, or to tell him, actually, what had happened to Mary. He says to Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now, again, this is something that all churches agree on, all Christian churches, that Jesus is, in fact, God the Son who became man. He was the one who was conceived in the womb of the virgin. He took to himself our nature. He actually became a man. The reason why he became a man was so that he could die for the sins of his people, so he could have their sins laid on him on the cross, and he could pay for them all. You see, as God, of course, he could not die. But the wages of sin is death, the Bible says. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are the ones who owe the debt. And so in order to pay the price, he became one with us. But of course, he also had to be God in order to make a payment that would be great enough to pay for all the sins for all those whom he was going to die for. Now, justice would say that perhaps an ordinary man might be able to take the place of one other man in God's judgment, one for one. But this one actually dies for a number, a multitude, which is so great that no man could number them. Now, how could God be just and give just one ordinary man for, to pay for that particular, pay that particular price? Well, the fact is, God couldn't be. That's why Jesus had to be more than just a man. He had to be more worthy than a man, and as God, he is infinitely worthy, which means the sacrifice that he makes is actually able to pay for the sins of an infinite number of people because of his infinite worthiness. So he had to be man to die, but he had to be God so that the value of his death would be great enough to make the payment. And we also know from Scripture that after Jesus died on the cross, he was buried. He remained in the tomb for three days, but then he rose again. Matthew 28, 6, the angel said, he is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. And then Jesus ascended into heaven. Uh, the angels, uh, well, actually the, the apostles, as they were watching Jesus, he, it says, after he had said the things that he said to them, the last words he spoke, he was lifted up, and while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now again, all Christian churches agree on these points. Jesus Christ is God and man. He was born of a virgin, that he died, he was buried, he was raised again on the third day, and he ascended up into heaven. That's not hard to understand. That's, again, that's what the Bible teaches, quite clear. Just read it for you, uh, for you from the Bible. Now, fourthly, we all agree on what it is you have to do in order to be saved by what Jesus Christ did. 
You have to trust Jesus. You have to trust what he did alone in order to save you. John 3.16, perhaps the most read verse in all of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Notice the qualification, whosoever believes. You need to trust in Jesus Christ to save you. You cannot trust in yourself. You cannot trust in your own works. You can't even trust in your own faith. You need to trust Jesus to save you. The Bible says, by the works of the law, no flesh or no one will be justified in his sight. There is nothing you can do. And by the way, there are no better works than the works of the law because the law tells you what true righteousness is. It tells you what is right versus what is wrong. It tells you what true love is. There, there is no better standard in all the world, but even keeping the law, even if you could do it perfectly, which you cannot, you could not be justified by it. And the reason is, of course, because you can't keep it perfectly and because you're already guilty when you come into the world of Adam's sin. You have to trust Jesus in his works and not yours. You need to trust his sacrifice on the cross to pay for your sins. Now, the Bible also says you need to repent. You need to turn away from your sins. Acts 3.19, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. The Lord will not forgive you if you continue to rebel against him, if you continue to do the things that he hates, if you continue to offend him. Now, it is true that even those who trust Jesus and have turned from their sins still sin every day. But the Lord also knows by his grace within their lives that they're doing everything they can to try to live that kind of life he wants them to live. And when they sin, they repent of those sins again. And of course, the Bible says you must also follow him and try to do the works that he wants you to do. That's actually a part of repentance. But just in case you didn't understand it, I thought I would separate that out. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And let me just say this. You are not saved by your works. You are saved by the works of Christ if you're saved at all. But if you are saved by the grace of Christ, you will do good works. You will follow the Lord. You will repent of your sins. You will do everything he calls you to do because he is working that work of grace in your heart. He's given you his Holy Spirit that makes you want to do those things. You're not saved by those things. That is the evidence that you have been saved when your life is transformed. But the point is you can't get to heaven on your own, not by your own works. The Bible says there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who seeks for God. There is none who does good. There is not even one. You must trust in what Jesus Christ has done alone to save you. Again, Paul writes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. That's one of the clearest passages in Scripture. And again, there are things in the Bible that are difficult to understand, but this is not difficult, and all Christian churches agree on this, that you must trust in Jesus alone to save you, not in your works. And if you do trust him, he will save you. Now, finally, we all agree that Jesus is coming again. We all agree that there is life after death. We all agree that there is heaven and hell. And we do agree that when Jesus Christ comes, there is going to be a judgment and there is going to be a final separation. I mean, if there were no heaven or hell, if there was no coming of Christ, if there was no accountability at the end of life, then maybe it really wouldn't matter except what happens in this life, whether you trust Jesus or not, whether you repent of your sins or not. But when you know this is coming at the end of the road and you know that life continues in heaven or in hell, it does make a big difference what you do with Jesus Christ. This is something that all churches agree on. 
The Bible says that Jesus is ruling over the world right now. When he ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and he is ruling and reigning, and he will until all his enemies are subdued. Author to the Hebrews writes, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. The Bible says the last enemy is death, which he will vanquish when he comes again and raises the dead. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now again, we may not all agree on when he is coming because no one really knows the day or the hour. And we may not necessarily all agree on what's going to happen when he comes again. But we all agree on this, that when he returns, there will be a judgment. And that judgment will be decisive. It will be final. And um, it will determine which of two places we will go. Again, um, I believe it's Paul who preaches in Acts 17 says this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. The Bible says that on that day, those who have trusted in him and have turned from their sins and have lived for his glory will be welcomed into the new heavens and the new earth, that kingdom which God has prepared for his people from before the foundation of the world. We see at the end of the, of the judgment written this in Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The Lord will point to that evidence that shows that they really did trust in Jesus Christ. They really did repent of their sins. They really were following Jesus because they were doing his works. And you know, when Jesus says that to the righteous, the righteous are going to look at Jesus and say, Lord, when did we see you in these circumstances? And when did we come to you and minister to you? Jesus will say, and inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you've done it to me. By the way, that's a very uh, good reason why we should meet together in fellowship because we have gifts that we are to serve one another with. And the Lord Jesus is looking at that service right here in the final judgment. And he's saying, this was my need and you came to me, you met that need. And he's talking about you met it within the brethren. The least of these brothers of mine, if you've done it to them, you've done it to me. But these are the ones the king will say, inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. And then it goes on to say, these will go away into eternal life. But with regard to those who haven't trusted Jesus and haven't repented of their sins, they will go away into eternal punishment. Again, in the same passage, then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then these who are on the left of Christ among the goats will say to him, Lord, when did we see you in need and didn't meet these needs? And he'll say the same thing he said to the others, inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these brothers of mine, you have not done it to me. So these are the ones who didn't trust Jesus, didn't repent of their sins, didn't follow after him. In other words, they didn't do what was right. They didn't do what was loving. Instead, they just continued to love themselves at the expense of everyone else. These are the ones who have offended God, and for their crimes, they will enter into the eternal 
fire. By the way, that fire does not just burn you up. That fire torments you throughout eternity because that is what sins against an infinite God and infinite love actually deserve. So I think from what we've just seen, you really can't excuse yourself by the fact that no one agrees on what the Bible says because all Christian churches who read the Bible know that these things are true. They are actually quite clear. And I think it also tells you that it does matter what you believe. It matters so much that God made it painfully clear so that anyone who has even average intelligence can read it and understand it. And so you're faced with a decision this morning. Will you continue to excuse yourself for not believing on the basis of what other people are saying about the Bible and end up, by doing so, being condemned to the eternal flames? Or will you listen to what the Bible says? And will you trust in this Jesus Christ, the Son of God who became man, who offers himself to you as a savior? And remember, you don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. Nobody deserves it. But God offers him out of infinite love. Will you trust Jesus and receive him as your savior who offers himself to you? And by the way, Jesus does say that if you are willing to come to him, he's not going to hold you back. He's not going to cast you away. He's going to receive you if you come. Will you trust Jesus? Will you turn from your sins? Will you begin to live the kind of life that he calls you to live? And remember, what he calls you to do is not a bad thing. What he calls you to do is the right thing, to love other people, to love him, to do what is right, to stop injuring people and taking advantage of people and taking things from them that don't belong to you or promoting yourself over their backs, as it were. That's what the Lord, that's what offends him. That, that's what's sinful. And when you treat him as though he doesn't exist or you treat him as though he's your servant or you treat him as though he's an enemy. Those are sins against, again, infinite love. What God is calling you to do is absolutely good. It's absolutely right. It's something you should want to do anyway if your mind and heart were working properly. It's what you would want to do. But again, the fact that God wants you to do what's good and you don't want to do it just, again, shows you the sin that's in your heart and the character of that sin. It keeps you away from God. It is evil, as our Lord Jesus also says. So what are you going to do? Jesus says the road that leads to destruction is broad, and there are many that go in that way. But the road that leads to life is narrow, and there are few that go in that way. The Bible says that you're on the broad road. If you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, you are on your way to destruction. So will you continue to walk down that road and go into the wide gates of hell that every day are swallowing up so many people? Or will you turn into the narrow path by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? The Lord calls you to turn from your sins. Why will you perish? Why will you die? Turn from your sins and live. It's the only right thing to do. The Lord says that if you're willing to do that, if you will trust in him and turn from your sins, he will give you the strength that you need to walk in that road. You know, sometimes it, it is true that people get sick of their sin. They're, they're sick of what it's costing them. They're sick of how it's destroying their lives. And sin is actually suicide. When you commit sins, you are injuring yourself, you are hurting yourself, and step by step, you are continuing to go down a path that's going to lead to your ultimate destruction, but on the way, it takes a piece of you each time you commit it. If you're sick of what sin is doing to you, and you want to be healed, then come to Jesus Christ. Let me close with this final offer and, and see if you can see the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ in this. He says, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
May God give you the grace to receive this offer of Christ and come to him and know what it is to rest in Christ. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our hearts.